So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, it's my pleasure to present to you some data here from uh, a recent phase one clinical trial that we did with our broadly neutralizing antibody 10-1074 in both uh, HIV infected and uninfected subjects. Uh, the trial was done at Rockefeller University and the University of Cologne. And uh, I'm gonna share with you some data and some of our exciting findings. So I'm sure that uh, the concept of immunotherapy and prevention with broadly neutralizing antibodies for most in the audience doesn't need a lot of introduction, but just for those that are not as familiar, um, the recent years have seen the discovery of a number of different broadly neutralizing antibodies that targeted uh, different sites of vulnerability on the envelope spike. And our ultimate goal would be to use these in the setting of immunotherapy and prevention uh, in human subjects in a combination. So, so far this concept of using these antibodies in humans has been uh, explored for two antibodies, uh, VRC01 and 3VNC117. Both of these target the CD4 binding site, but we really don't know much about antibodies that target other epitopes and whether or not they would be safe in human subjects and also whether they have antiviral activity. So we chose to focus on another group of antibodies that like patch antibodies, and we have a candidate called 10-1074 that we want to advance into clinical development. So 10-1074, for those of you that are not familiar, was isolated uh, from an IAVI donor, the same as uh, PGT-121 to 124 were isolated from, was isolated by bait sorting. For the purpose of this study, we made it as an IgG1 subtype antibody. We made no modifications, so this is not an LS variant or any FAB modification uh, of any sort. So we used the parental antibody as it was, as we pulled it from the human subject. Um, and this antibody, as goes for all the members of this antibody class, is very, very potent. It's a little less broad than CD4 binding site antibodies, but still pretty broad. And what you can see at the bottom, we've already successfully tested this antibody, uh, both in the subject of prevention, in the context of prevention and treatment in uh, non-human primates. So with that knowledge, we then set out to do a phase one clinical trial where we infused a total of 33 individuals, uh, 14 HIV negative, 19 HIV positive. We gave them a single infusion of 10-1074, as you can see here at the three different dose levels. So we had a dose escalation phase where we escalated from three milligrams per kilogram all the way until 30 milligrams per kilogram and then gave a larger number of subjects uh, that high dose. And you can see here that we followed subjects for a total of 24 weeks. The two more things that I uh, want you to take away from the slide. First of all, the lowest dose groups in the HIV positives in the study were all on ART, while the rest of the subjects were all chronically HIV-1 infected viremic subjects. So I'll uh, show you some viral load data on those later. And the other thing is uh, that you can see here that in any of the dose escalation phases, we only always infuse three individuals. That essentially already tells you that the infusions were super safe, uh, well tolerated, we didn't run into any problems. Um, so in that respect, a uh, good um, clinical product. So the next thing we then looked at is whether or not this antibody is uh, stable over long periods of time in human subjects. Uh, we did that by TZMBL assay. So we took sera from patients after 10-1074 infusion. And as you can see here, we then tested them against 10-1074 uh, sensitive strains that were not sensitive to autologous serum. And what's shown here are geometric means of the three different dose groups. These are non-infected subjects. And what you can appreciate is that the antibody has a pretty solid half-life. It lasts for about 12 weeks in the lowest dose groups and lasts actually for about half a year um, in the higher dose groups. And that works out to a half-life of a little more than three weeks. We also then looked in HIV-1 infected subjects. You see here, the half-life is only about half of what it is in the other group. Uh, the decay is much more rapid and that's something that we've already observed with our other um, candidate, 3BNC117. We think that that is due to uh, defective envelope protein floating around and capturing the antibody. Um, but you still see the antibody even in this dose group uh, or the HIV infected last generally for um, about three months. So also a pretty solid half-life. So now the next question, obviously very interesting for treatment, is does the antibody have antiviral activity in human subjects? And so as I said, the three milligram per kilogram subjects were all on ART, so I'm only showing you the higher dose groups here. And you see here, these were subjects that received 10 milligram per kilogram. We had three subjects, viral load here around 10 to the four. And you can see here in the relative log drop plot and then here in the average for the group, subjects dropped by about 1.4 logs. Um, they do so about a week after infusion and then they return to baseline about four weeks after infusion. If you then look at the higher dose groups, what you'll first of all notice down here, we had two subjects that did not respond to the antibody. 
we can pretty easily explain why that is, um, and that's because of mutations in 10-1074 contact sites. But we had 11 subjects that you see here that very nicely responded to the antibody. Average lock drop here is somewhat similar, about 1.5 locks. Looks like subjects maybe take a little bit longer um, to return back to baseline, but that's probably due to these two uh, super nicely responding subjects down here. On average, it actually looks uh, like the 10 and 30 milligram per kilogram dose group are somewhat comparable, but with a small end, that's kind of hard to say at this point. But the other thing that you will probably already think about is having seen the half-life data that I showed you in the previous slide, that these patients must be rebounding at pretty high levels of antibody, and that's actually true. So they rebounded about 60 micrograms per valve of 10-1074. So what happened to the virus? Um, and for the sake of time, I'm going to show you or illustrate what happened to the virus. Uh, first of all, here at the example of one subject. This is one HC3 subject that received 30 milligrams per kilogram. We have here a phylogenetic tree obtained by single genome sequencing of envelope. See two time points in gray pre-infusion and then in red four weeks post-infusion. And what you can easily see is that the red sequences and the gray sequences are intermingled. If you pay attention to the scale, uh, this is a fairly diverse subject, so it has a fairly diverse HIV-1 population. But you still see that a variety of different envelope strains that are present in this individual are able to give rise to an escape variant, indicating that it's not a single virus we're bottlenecking for, but that any given virus in this individual is pretty much able to generate escape to this antibody in some way. So in order now to understand how that happened, I just briefly want to recapitulate how 10-1074 binds to the HIV-1 envelope spike. So this is a crystal structure obtained by Harry Gristick in Pamela Bjorkman's lab um, of 10-1074 with a fully glycosylated BG505 trimer. And what you can see from the structure, you see it here already, and then you see it better here in the detail, is that 10-1074, and that's in contrast to other lichen patch antibodies, buries most of its surface with a 3-3 jute lichen. So that's uh, one of its most important contacts to hold on to the virus. It then makes further contacts that are kind of hard to see in the protein backbone. To make that a little simpler, I put that here in a text alignment for you. So you can see here uh, that the antibody makes important contacts at position 325, 327, and then with the end link like oscillation motif here at uh, position 332. So if we now go back to our sequence data, this time on all individuals that we sequence from the study, and look at the amino acid sequences, and look at this GDIR motif where the antibody binds and the end-linked glycosylation site at 332, what you see indicated by the gray color is that most of our subjects, um, that goes for all the subjects that responded, are gray, meaning that an intact GDIR and an intact 332 glycosylation site. In red and in blue, uh, we have the two subjects that did not respond to the antibody, one uh, HD9K and one HD2, that both respectively had a point mutation either here at 325 or 332. And you see the other subjects, except for one that's a bit heterogeneous, all have an intact GDR and an intact 332 lichen. Four weeks after the infusion, that picture completely changes. And what we see is that 90% of sequences, or actually more than 90% of sequences, carry a point mutation at one of three positions. So there's mutually exclusive point mutations either at 332, 334, thus deleting the 332 lichen, or at the 325 position. You see this here also. Um, uh, broken down by patient, and you can see that in any given patient, the majority of sequences four weeks after infusion are mutated, and you see that there's a little different pattern across patients, but there's some mutations that always recur. And what you can also appreciate is that the 332 and 334 side um, have a number of different mutations that occur, while 325 seems to be a restricted spectrum of mutations that we observed. So we then went ahead, obviously, and tried um, or tested pseudoviruses. So what we did is we went to the phylogenetic trees and picked paired day zero and week four viruses um, to uh, get down to the fact that there's single mutations that mediate escape. And what you can see here is that all the viruses, as expected, were very, very 10-1074 sensitive before infusion. And then the viruses that we tested, except for the few ones that were gray in the other slide, all have completely lost sensitivity to the antibody. And that's mainly also true for binding by PGT-121, an antibody that was cloned from the same individual. where we had one uh, subject, though, where the envelope backbone somehow still allowed binding of PGT-121, but not of 10-1074. But on a positive note, and what you can see here, um, on the right side of the slide, is that sensitivity to other broadly neutralizing antibodies would not have changed. So combination therapy um, still seems like a very promising concept. So the other thing that we then looked at, because naturally, 
clade B viruses, and all our patients here were clade B infected, naturally carry a lichen in 332, and they also have an intact GDR motif usually. So we were wondering whether over time, as the antibody shown here in white drops, uh, whether or not the wild type would return. And that's actually what we see, and we see it in particular, for example, here, in our two longest responding individuals, where somehow right as the antibody drops, the majority of sequences return to an intact GDR and an intact 332 lichen. So that to us somehow highlighted at least that there's a relative fitness loss, even though viruses were able to replicate in the presence of 10-1074 quite well, but it seems like as, um, as there are wild type alleles competing with them, they lose out. The last aspect that we then looked at is how fast do these escape mutations arise? What are the kinetics? And what you can see is that there's a heterogeneous mixture. So we have some individuals uh, shown here where most of the sequences one week after infusion are still unmutated. And we have some individuals that you see here where most of the sequences are already mutated one week after infusion. And 1HD1 was one of our fastest rebounding individuals, uh, so we decided to take a deeper look at that individual. So we paired up with uh, Ben Murrell at UCSD, did Pacific Biosciences smart sequencing on the full-length envelope. And I'm again showing you here a phylogenetic tree. You see that generally, besides the fact that there's many, many more sequences, it recapitulates what I showed you um, with the other individuals. So you see there's intermingling of day zero and week four sequences across the entire tree. But once you get to the depth of a few hundred viruses uh, that we think we sequenced here, what you start seeing are very rare escape variants, similar to a frequency what's been published for some of the ART drugs, where you see here, for example, this mutation at 3 to 5 that comes up later, and this mutation here at 3, 3, 4 that also comes up later in this patient, which I think highlights an issue that we have to think about down the road, which is uh, whether or not there's some degree of pre-existing resistance in people to some of these broadly neutralizing antibodies. So with that, I um, already am at the end of my presentation. I want to conclude that 10-1074 uh, infusion was very safe and well tolerated. The antibody has good pharmacokinetic properties, uh, has a s very good half-life in human subjects. It is antivirally active in subjects that are infected with sensitive viruses. It surprisingly led to a very convergent form of evolution, which is very different from what was observed in the CD4 binding site antibody studies, where different subjects made very different escape mutations. Here we saw a very consistent picture um, of 332 lichen loss, or 325 mutation. Um, but in total, I think we can actually already conclude that lichen patch antibodies seem like promising agents uh, in combination regimens for immunotherapy and prevention down the road. And there's a, a lot of people I have to thank for this work. Uh, for the sake of time, there's two that I bolded here that I really want to highlight. That's Marina Kasky, who leads our clinical team at Rockefeller University, and uh, Florian Klein, who leads a clinical team at our partner site, the University of Cologne, uh, who has been very helpful uh, in providing us or uh, recruiting uh, viremic subjects for our trials. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, thank you.